Hello and welcome back to the channel. It is me, Mark, and today I am excited for a very weird reason because it's not something I would normally be excited about, but I've had a call out sent through to the office and the nearest one to that job in our little team. So I'm being dispatched over there. And usually with call outs, they are not something I look forward to because nine times out of 10, it's some leaky waste pipe that's dripped water into an electrical connection causing an RCD to trip. And we've got to find it and then do something about it. I and mean, you know, whatever trade you're in, you'd be used to that when you get the call outs. If you're a plumber and it's a block toilet, it's never something we're really looking forward to, is it? Is the honest answer. But it's the stuff we have to go and do. In this case, it is um, a pen bolt protection device that's operated. And I'm excited about that, weirdly. It's the interesting chat of industry. How commonplace are these pen bolts? Is it something that's going to occur more often? Are these protection devices needed. Um, so yeah, it's flagged up uh, an air of interest. I'm looking forward to going to have a look at it. It's a Garo unit, so it's up front from the EV charger. This is an install that's been in a number of years. It's not one of ours. So there is a, an EV charger separate to the pen bolt detector. The rest of the install is working as normal. So let's go to site and see what is actually going on. So what does the actual good book tell us? This is guidance note three, and it does mention about diverted neutral currents, basically explains what they are and says in appendix E, there is a procedure to use if we're gonna check for them. I'm not gonna hold it against the authors, but it is actually appendix D, not B, but there we go. Um, and it tells you what the dangers are for your diverted neutral currents, pen bolts, and how you can check for them um, and some of the voltages that might be present because of it. Okay, your steps are basically use a, a clamp meter to see if you've got any current flowing in the earthing system. And you should really only have a small current of a few milliamps on up to 100 amp supply. Larger currents, which it hasn't determined what those large currents are, it's based on engineering judgment, might lead you to think there's a problem. You can then switch the power off to the installation, lock off and prove dead. And your test for proving dead should be as normal. If you're still getting voltages in places you don't expect, you may have a diverted neutral current. You can check for current flowing in the main earthing conductor and your bonds using a clamp meter. Um, the currents drop to zero on extremely small level is what you'd expect. But if you put a few bits and pieces on in the install and you see that current rising, and that may start to indicate you've got a problem. That's what that's telling us there. Uh, then check for presence of voltage using a non-contact voltage detector at the main earthing terminal along the length of the earthing conductor, your bonds um, and such. Now with this, I used a contact voltage indicator and the reason for that is the DNO ops who are generally working in rubber boots, rubber gloves, they are insulated to a large degree from that capacitive coupling that non-contact voltage indicators use. So they won't work and they can give you a false reading of nothing been there when maybe there is. So my preference is always to use um, a physical contact voltage indicator. But it's what it says in there, so you can do that as long as you're happy that you have got that capacitive coupling. Then disconnect your main protective um, bonding conductors, nothing unusual should be noted, but if you've got evidence of current when the main protective bonds are disconnected, so typically as you take them out of the terminal, you may see a spark um, or measure voltage between your bonds and your main earth. So it tells you next to recheck for the presence of voltage using your uh, non-contact voltage detector, gain at the air terminal along all the extraneous conductive parts, and there should be no voltage indicated. If voltage appears, um, so your voltage indicators don't detect a neutral current, while it is able to flow using an alternative path. But a bolt stick should be used because that will illuminate to the voltage, basically. Reconnect your main bonds so that the insulation resistance tests can be carried out. Carried out. Nothing unusual should be noted. If you've got evidence of current flow with the main bonding conductors connected, could have a problem. And then it says in TN systems, you could do an EFLI test, so your ZS, ZE measurement, um, and it gives you the typical value you'd expect to find with a Z. Uh, TNCS and TNS system. So if you're getting an external EFLI that's high, that could be an indication you've got a DNC issue. So we'll go and have a look out on site at how we run through that with an actual real world example. So out at site, one of the first things to do is familiarize yourself with the system. As you can see, we've got solar on this one and some of this switch gear looks a little bit questionable. At our main intake, we do have that TNCS PME supply and you can see that is running through a switch fuse which takes power off into the house. Now I'm using this TIS 570 clamp meter just to get an idea of what is going on in the earthing system while everything is connected. 
This is a good way to see what currents are flowing in certain parts of your install before you expose yourself to any terminals. You can see I'm looking for any DC blinding that we might have within the earthing on there and now to see what current is actually flowing in that earthing conductor. And as we saw in GN3, a small amount in the milliamp range is to be accepted. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too concerned about that so far. We can clamp across the bonding conductors as well and see what kind of current is flowing within those. And equally, we can go around our tails and have a look and see what kind of leakage currents are maybe leaving them. And obviously, with an inverter on this circuit, there is consumer electronics in the house. You are going to get a bit of natural earth leakage. It is to be expected. So there's nothing really presenting itself there that is screaming out at me, diverted neutral current. We can use our voltage indicator. And again, this is the contact one. I wish I had put my gloves on. You really, really should be doing that for a basic level of protection. But it slipped my mind and these things will happen. So you can see that I'm using the Martindale contact voltage indicator. And I prefer those to the non-contact variants, as I've said already in this video. And you can see there's nothing demonstratingly any voltage on that earthing. Now if we go out to the charge point, we can have a look what's going on in terms of its voltages. And this is before I've done anything. So you can see we've got the 240 volts or so between our live and neutral. And then every so often we're getting that little spike that's just popping up there on the neutral to earth. And equally the voltage is dropping away on our line neutral line earth voltages, as you can see there. And that is basically as the um, Garrow protected device, I'll show you, is dropping in and out. And you can see if we go inside, we can have a little look at the EV board. So there's a specific Garrow board for that. And if I pop the contact voltage indicator onto it again, this is with the power off just to see if there is any voltage displaying on the consumer unit itself. Now, obviously, if that is pulsating in the supply, it might not be present while you've got your probes on there. So always worthwhile keeping that in mind. And again, consistently check your device. So we're going to have a look and see if there is any voltages on the earth and neutral bars. And I have put the power on into here just to see if we can detect that voltage on the line. As you will see, it did there. Now this is a GS38 approved probe, so we're safe in using it in that way. But caution should be displayed whenever you are around live terminals. Inside here now, the power is back off and I'm just having a look in the EV charger itself to see if we've got any cause for concerns. Moisture ingress, it could be the charge point itself that is presenting a problem and upsetting the garret. So you can see here with that L1 light, it's a bit hard to tell on camera because the LED isn't flashing in the real world. It's solid and then it'll occasionally drop out. But on camera, it just appears to be flashing nonstop. But you can see the longer pauses. That is when the Garrow device is cutting the power in and out. And if we look with our um, TIS voltage indicator, you can see those voltages dropping away as the Garrow cuts that supply off to the EV charger between both line and neutral and live and the CPC. It is worth noting that I have also done um, ZE tests at the boards or ZDB, um, as we would call it, and they were totally normal. And again, the same from socket circuits. I've taken ZS measurements and there's nothing out of the ordinary in any of those. So I've gone through the sequence of tests within Guidance Note 3, as indicated. And the only thing I can really determine is that we've got an issue with the Garrow PME pen fault detection device itself, rather than something at the network side or with the solar PV. That all seems to be absolutely normal. So you'll have seen through the course of the video using some of the contact voltage indicators and I've explained why I use those. In this case, because I got to put the gloves on, it's no big deal if that had been non-contact, but these are always better in my opinion. So well worth getting in your kit <coughs> because they do give a more reliable, accurate value and, and the DNO people will tell you the same. And then you gain you've your little leakage clamp meters. So this one from TIS is absolutely golden because it does DC and AC. So that's the TIS 570. And you can see what's going on in your earthing conductors and also with your line and neutrals with the system energized to see what um, current you've got leaking out your install. Because obviously these things will still leak naturally. There's solar PV on the install I was looking at. That's the EV charge, but that wasn't working. Then there's all the natural electronics that are in an install and they'll leak both AC and DC to see what's going on with your tails and then sort of matching that up with what's in the air thing can give you a good idea of if you've got anything external impacting that or if there's something going on with the supply to the property that's causing those things to fluctuate and move around. 
and it's a really good way of getting an understanding of what is potentially there before you start putting your fingers into places you wouldn't want them to be if there was a problem. But point of note with all of that, they are only as good as the time you've got them on the system. So as soon as you've disconnected them again, you are blind to what is going on. So don't just assume it is all good. You may have a problem still present that's sort of surfacing here and there. It could be a, a failing connection in the road that sometimes is holding and sometimes isn't. So don't just assume because you've measured for a few seconds that you're all good. Still proceed with caution until you've actually determined and verified what that fault is. Um, and again, I'm annoyed with myself for not putting those gloves on, but we all make mistakes from time to time. I should have been doing that. So if you are going out to a potential pen fault, make sure at the very least, get your gloves on, give yourself that basic level of protection you're going to need. Obviously, I was using um, the GS38 compliant probes and I was happy to be in that environment. I wasn't really exposed to what would be live terminal under normal conditions, but obviously the earthing system during a pen fault can form part of those live um, conductors so really is something that you should be doing um, and I will be trying harder next time I'm not immune to making mistakes when I'm a little bit excited going out to look at a pen ball um, and investigate that one as it was we was fine um, the issue was actually with that Garrow device the voltages that you saw fluctuating when I was out at the charge point were just as that was switching in and out so it doesn't open all those connections at the same time so as you would get with a neutral or an air drop out in your supply, if it drops out there, you still see those fluctuating voltages due to that. Um, the wider install, I repeated that test inside at a socket front and also at the consumer unit. I didn't record those things for two reasons. One, it felt a bit sketchy at the consumer unit holding probes on a phone, and that's where content and safety equations balance out in the right way. So I put my phone down and did what I was there to do in a safe way. And then out at the, the kitchen with the sockets, the customer's there working at the dining table. It didn't feel right to be recording. I don't like doing it anyway. But rest assured, those voltages were sat rock solid. It was zero volts between the neutral and the earth and the 240 volts between the line and CPC line and neutral, as we would have expected. And they weren't fluctuating. They weren't moving at all. That was with the EV switched on and doing whatever it was doing with its contactor with the PV on and off. I tried it always round. The ZE, ZS measurements were all absolutely on the money. There was no issue there that I could detect. So I was very happy to determine that the issue was with that Garrow unit. Obviously those things are under considerable load for quite a long time. It's been in four years and it's probably just worn itself out um, and needs to be replaced. Customers in the process of moving house, we gave them the option of having a newer EV charge point with that detection built in. And obviously also we could also offer in some solar diversion as well as part of that using a wall box, for example, or a Zappi. Because they're moving house, they were looking for the quickest, lowest cost solution to the problem. So we're gonna go for just replacing that Garrow unit for now and see if that solves it. Um, it might not, there could still be a problem in the charge point. We couldn't test that because obviously the power won't hold for more than a few seconds. So any kind of investigative functional and um, otherwise testing down there with my uh, EV100 from TIS wasn't possible. You know, if you don't have energy there, there's nothing you can really do. And I wasn't in their mind to bypass it when there could be a potential fault. We're gonna put the things we need in place and then approach that test in the future. So if that turns out to be the case, we can work with a customer to see what the best outcome for that is. If we're gonna replace that for a charge point that doesn't need the pen fault, just get rid of it. Or if we're gonna get a, a budget charger in there to combine with it, whatever we do, I will share with you on the content. We're just waiting for that Garrow device to be delivered. It wasn't on the shelf at the local wholesaler, so we've got to wait on that one. And um, yeah, it's been interesting. I hope that's been useful for any of you following along with this and some of the things that you can take forward if you ever get called to somewhere where they might have a potential pen fault. Um, and there is videos on the Apprentice One to One YouTube channel where I've gone into it in a bit more detail on a three-phase system and some earlier content in and around here. It's just something to be aware of. Pen faults are super duper rare. I think there was four or 500 recorded incidents um, at a DNO level. They're not one of the bigger faults we find out in the network. There is other issues that result in hundreds of faults a week. So this is a bit of context in all of that. But obviously when those things have gone wrong, it can expose you to danger and awareness of it is super important. I think sometimes it gets a bit over egged out in industry um, and we're maybe trying to meet the demand of something that isn't actually there. Whether that becomes more of a problem in the future is open to debate. From what we're seeing, 
um, as renewables install as the actual load demands on people's installations are dropping as solar PV and battery systems get brought into play, they smooth out those peaks and troughs and there's actually less strain on the grid even with electric vehicles as I have in my house. So it's an interesting one, we shall see where that goes. If you've got any questions, as always, please do drop them in and otherwise I'll see you on the next one.